فيا سائلا عن منهج الحق يبتغي سلوك طريق القوم حقا ويسعد تأمل هداك الله ما قد نظمته تأمل من قد كان للحق يقصد الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على محمد وعلى آل محمد وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله we're going to go through we're going to go through a biography of the author since it's very important to go through biographies if somebody ever wants to put their himma up high they should always read it, the biographies of the people that before the great ones Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Rahab Rahimullah was not far away from us so inshallah this can motivate us to do khair his name was Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab Ibn Sulaiman Ibn Ali Ibn Muhammad Ibn Ahmed Ibn Rashid Ibn Burayd Ibn Muhammad Ibn Mushraf Ibn Umar he was from the Qabil, the tribe of Banu Tamim. His birth, the Sheikh, may Allah have mercy on him, was born in a town called Riyana. He was born in the year 1115 Hijr. Some say he was born in 1111 Hijri, but the first one is well known and more accurate, 1115. How was his upbringing? Because the people of before, the uh, ulama, the fudala, from before in our time, you look at their upbringing because their upbringing had a lot to do with their da'wah and how they were. Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, his household was one of ilm, knowledge, and nobility, and attachment to Islam. His father was a alim, a scholar. His grandfather, rahimahullah, was a scholar as well to a niche. The Shaykh, he memorized the Quran before reaching the age of 10. He also studied fiqh, fiqh al Hanbali, when it came to the Madhab of Imam Ahmed. He also put a great deal of time studying tafsir and hadith. And the Shaykh, he sought a lot of knowledge. And he spent a lot of time busy. He traveled throughout Najd. Najd is a region in Saudi Arabia. You're going to hear it a lot. It's a region in Saudi Arabia where it's close to Riyadh and Qasim and those places. Taib, he traveled throughout Najd and to Mecca to study with the ulama. Then he traveled to Al Medina and he studied under a Shaykh. Abdullah ibn Ibrahim al-Shamri. He also studied under his son, the Shaykh Abdullah ibn Ibrahim's son, who was strong in Fara'id, the laws of inheritance. And his name was Ibrahim al-Shamri. Then it was said that they introduced him to the great scholar of hadith named Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi. And the Shaykh, he taught Shaykh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab the science of hadith. And he also taught him Ilm al-Rajal, the science of men and the science related to narrators. He also gave him an ijaz, a permission to narrate the sources of, of the hadith and books that he took from him. Some of his teachers, his first teacher was his father, Shaykh Abdul Wahhab ibn Sulaiman. His other teacher was Shaykh Muhammad Hayat al sindi His other teacher was Shaykh Abdullah ibn Ibrahim ibn Yusuf. His other teacher was Shaykh Abdullah ibn Salim al-Basri al-Shafi'i. He also benefited from the books of the earliest scholars. It said that anytime he would hear something from the earliest scholars or found a manuscript, he would write it right away. And when I mean earliest scholars, I mean Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his student ibn al-Qayyim. Allah have mercy on him. What was the condition of Najd at that specific time? Najd, where the Shaykh lived, was an area of darkness where people were committing acts of shirk. They were going to the graveyards and worshipping the graves and so on. Uh, to the point I heard from one of our scholars, Hafizahullah, that he said that a man at that specific time had a statement and said, the people of Ta'if, Ta'if is a region in Saudi Arabia, that they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know Ibn Abbas. Meaning, they ask Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, they, when I mean they ask him, they worship him. Yani that their hearts were connected to Ibn Abbas. They used to worship Ibn Abbas, they used to eye upon him, and so on. Then another man replied back to what that man said, and he said, if they know Ibn Abbas, then at least they're the best. Why? Because Ibn Abbas knows Allah. If they don't know Allah, then the one who they're connected to, or connect themselves to, knows Allah. Tayyip, I ask you brothers, does this benefit a person? What the second guy said, that if they don't know Allah and they know Ibn Abbas, then at least they're the best. Why? Because Ibn Abbas knows Allah, and that them connecting themselves to Ibn Abbas is them knowing Allah. Does this benefit a person? Abadan. Abadan. Well, Allah doesn't benefit a person. Because if you don't know Allah, then you don't know his tawheed. You don't have ikhlas for Allah. You don't worship him alone. It will not benefit you. 
by connecting yourself to a righteous person. The mushrikeen of before, they used to worship the malaika, the angels, well, anbiya, the prophets, but this did not benefit them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted them in the Quran. Ibadah, worship, is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and alone. طيب. It was said in the year 1153 Hijri that Shaykh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab started his da'wah publicly, da'wah of Tawheed. He put a lot of efforts in it. And at that time, he was a Najd. And as I told you guys, Najd was, was, was very dark with shirk. And in that region of Najd, there was not one specific Amir, one specific leader that controlled it all. Every village had its own leaders. So if one person walked for one hour to another village, they would see another leader, Amir. If they went to another hour, they would see another Amir. To the point where the scholars say there was roughly 10 different Umarah, 10 different leaders in Najd. Everybody was the Amir, a leader of a village. When the Shaykh uh, Muhammad al-Dhahab, rahimahullah, he made his da'wah clear and apparent, starting called to Tawheed and refuting shirk, he was in Riyana. The Shaykh at that time, he broke down tombs that were built on the graves. And the leaders had no problem with it. It was something they agreed with him on. One of the Amirs, one of the Umara of Najd, only one of them was very angry at what the Shaykh was doing and his da'wah and his call. So he contacted the Amir of Uyayna. Remember I said the Shaykh was in Uyayna. And he told him what Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is doing is wrong and he must be stopped or killed. And he told him, or you have to give him to me or else I'll wage war on you. So the Amir of Uyayna went back to Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab and he told him what happened. And he told Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab that I don't have the quwa, I don't have the power to defend ourselves, but I will not turn you in. You just have to leave our land. And you can imagine how tough this was for the Shaykh. The Shaykh, he was a taqi, or someone who feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh, he replied back to him and he said, what I'm calling to is the deen of Allah. It's the haqq. And the one who defends the deen of Allah, Allah gives him izzah, Allah gives him honor. Honor in the dunya and the akhirah. So the shaykh advised him to stay steadfast and be patient. And the shaykh also told him, if you do this, where that Amir controls will come underneath you. By the will of Allah, the Amir, he rejected the shaykh. And he told him, you have to leave. So the shaykh, he left alone. And he went to another area in Najd called ad and the Amir of that region was called Muhammad ibn Sa'ud. So the Amir Muhammad ibn Sa'ud, he welcomed Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab to Atar Iyya. And the people told him that Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab was kicked out of Uyayna. So when Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab came to Atar Iyya, there were some women in the city of Atar Iyya. And the women, they were very happy that he came. And they were from the pious women. And they told the Amir Muhammad ibn Sa'ud, they said, this is a hadiyah, this is a gift from Ar-Rahman, it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's accept it. That they kicked this man out from Uyayna because he was calling to a tawheed and refuting shirk, that this is a hadiyah from Allah, let's accept it and let's not reject it. So the people grabbed him, they took him to the leader, the Amir, Muhammad bin Sa'ud, the Amir welcomed him. And the Amir was, seemed very, very happy because he knew what this man was carrying. Even though this is an Amir who has power who has everything and this man left by himself and is coming by himself he has no troops he has no nothing but he has something that they don't have and that's ilm just like earlier when i told you guys knowledge is something important and knowledge is what will uh, lift you up so when he met the amir they sat down and they started to make some arrangements and deals to agree on the amir also told the sheikh and you can see the amir was a rajul salih from Mosdahir, you can see that he was a pious man. He told the Shaykh, I give you one shart, one condition. And that condition, we have to agree on. And that is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us nasr, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us victory, that you don't leave us. And that you stay with us and you don't go anywhere else. Look at that, subhanAllah, ikhwah. This man of power is <laughs> giving a condition to a man that was kicked out and left a place by himself. This man has military and he's Amir. He's pretty much the president of his area. And he's telling this man who's by himself that I put one condition on you. And that is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us nasr, gives us victory, that you don't leave us and that you stay with us. That you don't go anywhere else. The Shaykh accepted it. And wallahi, all that's good of knowledge, ya The knowledge is what was carrying him. 
As a result of that, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab efforts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought forth the servants in the region out of darkness. And his da'wah spread outside Saudi Arabia. It went to the different regions. It went from Najd, as we said, was that specific area, to Hijaz, which is Makkah, Medina, Jeddah, all over. It spread to Syria. It spread to Egypt. It spread to Iraq. It spread to India, and many more. Many callers studied underneath him, spread his da'wah throughout the lands and nations. He conveyed his da'wah through his teachings and the books that he wrote. Sheikh, may Allah have mercy on him. He died in the year 1206 Hijri. He was a man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with a long life. He was 91 years old when he died. His life was one that was filled with goodness, guidance, patience. He was a teacher, he was a alim, he was a sheikh, he was a mujaddid, an instructor, the cult of Tawheed, and which war against shirk. That is a brief biography of Sheikh Muhammad al Wahab. Of course, he deserves a more detailed biography. This is something brief that, uh, that we could take in our time. Wallahi ya ikhwan, if you look at it, there's not a day in the world that his books are not taught. That his books are not taught. Surah Thalata, right now we're speaking. Someone is studying it in Africa, someone is studying it in Asia, someone is studying it in Europe. We'll be studying it. It's been translated in different languages. Wahada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad wa sahbihi ajma'in.